I used to put Mirage the historian on back. So a few days ago, I dropped a tape dealing with some Georgia history. And we're going to dive a little deeper into that because I saw the people um, enjoyed the tape. So we're going to kind of, you know, we're going to stretch that out a little bit more. What we're going to read into right now is, is some of the history um, in Georgia from about 1775 to about 1820. So what we're talking about right now is, is, you know, well after the American Revolution has already started, um, the foreign settlers who were the Spanish, the English, the French, etc., have already come in. They've already set up certain colonies across, um, you know, the coast of the east and along the, the south. Because in Louisiana, you had, you know, these people that's calling themselves the French. Now, real quick, before we go deeper into this, I want you to remember that, you know, during a lot of these times, the state jurisdiction lines were not you know mapped out um, to the best ability for example look at this picture right here now right here you have a picture in front of you which says population distribution in 1810 and it shows you the aboriginal or what they call an indian territory and they're showing you basically the territory that these settlers you know in the english had carved out for themselves up until about 1810 now as you can see right here that majority of georgia is still ran by Aboriginal Americans in 1810. This part where you don't see any lines that look like county lines, that is all Aboriginal American territory. Okay, so in 1810, this is how Georgia looked. This is how many Aboriginals still control Georgia on the far left. And on the right side, you see how many, you know, United States people were controlling certain parts of Georgia. All right. So as you can see right here in 1810, that, you know, it, it wasn't as many, um, so-called, you know, United States uh, providences, I'll say, you know, or areas for themselves. And we're going to read into um, some stuff. But let me just read this part real quick. It says Indians or Aborigines made up the other non-white group in Georgia. In 1780, most Georgia Indians showed little sign of the traits that were secure for the for them the title of five civilized tribes or civilized tribes but by 1820 great strides had been made towards adopting the white man's civilization to their own needs so they're already telling you right here that in 1780 the georgia aborigines had little signs and showed little you know traits of um adopting this european way of life but it says right here by by 1820, you're starting to have a lot more influence. And early 1800s is kind of leading you also into the American Civil War, which is really part two of the American Revolution. So right now, we're going to do a little reading, and then we will analyze the information as we talk about it. But that's what we're talking about. You know, We're talking about the early parts of the American Civil War, which was the United States coming into the South. And coming into the South to try to steal Aborigine land. So it had nothing to do with these two Caucasians fighting each other. The Caucasians that you saw in the South fighting on the Confederacy just so happened to be poor uh, Caucasian settlers who didn't necessarily want to be under the jurisdiction of the United States. They wanted to be able to carve their own lives out and destinies outside of the United States influence and control. So what you had a lot of them doing was is trying to team up with other aborigines since they both were fighting the same people so you're going to find a history where you're going to see so-called indians or native americans fighting on the side of the confederacy but i don't want you all to confuse that with you know jefferson davis and that confederate faction because you had two different sides of the confederacy you had the aborigines who were us that was fighting to get all these people off the land and then you had european caucasians that were in the south that didn't want to be under control of the United States and were going to later on use the ninth and 10th amendment to their, to their advantages, you know, how it gives the states their own rights, etc. So it's, you know, so the Confederacy, you know, separating itself from the union is, is the history of what we are talking about, you know, just these Caucasians in the South trying to carve out, you know, um, I guess a future for themselves. But right now we're going to read about, uh, the Creek Indians and just some other information going on in Georgia in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. 
right before the American Civil War. So you people need to realize that the American Civil War was just a war to steal more land from the Aborigines. That's all it was about. It was not about freeing so-called black people or any of that. All right. So let's go into this. One or more, excuse me, one of the most important concerns of the state government was relations with the Creek Indians. Once the war had ended and whites came into Georgia in increasing numbers, there were insistent demands for them for more Indian land west and north of the 1763 and 1773 secessions. The lands more desired were between the Ogeechee and Okanee rivers. Georgia Creek relations in the 1780s were complicated by several factors. First and foremost was the mixed breed Alexander McGilvery, an able chieftain up, up, up among the upper creeks who opposed almost anything that white Georgians wanted. McGilvery was a master at playing Georgia and the United States against the British and the Spanish. He hoped to benefit of the creeks. When the British gave up the Florida to the Spanish, the British Indian trading firm of Panton Leslie and Company remained and exerted considerable influence as one of the main creek suppliers of European goods. The Spanish were willing to give the creeks sufficient munitions to raid the Georgia frontier, but never enough to carry on a real war that many creeks in McGilvery wanted. Georgia was not strong enough to fight the creeks alone, and she could never give, or excuse me, she could never get adequate help from the United States or South Carolina. So this is showing you what I'm saying right here. See, Georgia right now is an independent um, corporation, you know, or, or it's, it's separate from the United States. And look at how it says right here that Georgia was not strong enough to fight the creeks on loan and she could not get help from the United States of South Carolina. Because these are all different, you know, they're really all different factions up under one European umbrella, you know. So the United States will be the main, well, it is how it goes. The primary main umbrella will be what you know of as the the British Virginia Company, the tobacco company that was created in the early 1600s. This is the first major umbrella. Up under that, you have the system or corporation known as the United States of America. The United States of America is an extension of the tobacco farms and the tobacco company of the English. And up under the United States of America, you have all the what they call so-called states. So the state of South Carolina, the state of Georgia, the state of Tennessee, etc. These are all just corporations up under other corporations that are up under a major big corporation. So the big major corporation that all this is still stemming from is the tobacco company um, that the British had in Virginia. All right. So let's continue. But the creeks, as always, remain divided in their feelings and allegiance. The lower creeks who lived on the Chattahoochee and Flint rivers nearest to Georgia were usually more friendly and less under the influence of McGilvery than were the upper creeks. It was the land of the lower creeks that the Georgians desired and some lower creeks were usually willing to trade or sign treaties of secession or of session, excuse me, treaties that McGilvery always repudiated as illegal. So you had right here, basically you had two factions. You had, you know, Aborigines who wanted to work with the European, you had Aborigines who did not want to work with the European. All right, so this man that they sent by the name of Alexander McGilvery, they saying that he was a mixed breed um, Upper Creek. So he was a Creek Indian of mixed breed. So more than likely he was mixed with Aborigine and Spanish or Aborigine and some other European group, you know. But this was a guy who basically wanted, you know, no, he wanted nothing to do with these with these Caucasian people, and he was fighting on the Creek side to basically get the United States and these Caucasians out of here. All right, and he represented the um, let me see right here real quick. He represented the Upper Creeks. Okay, so this guy that didn't want the United States around was on the side of the Upper Creeks, but the Lower Creeks were a little more friendly, and they were a little more willing to work with the United States. So look at how you can't really you know, solve the problem when you got a certain group of your own people that want to team up with these folks. It's just like today. You know, you got a lot of so-called black people who, you know, may want to be freed of colonialism. 
and may want to have their own independent stuff. But then you got another faction of black people that say, well, you know, how we live right now is kind of cool. You know, although the racism and, and discrimination don't feel that well, but, you know, we've already assimilated into society. So let's not, you know, let's not disturb what's going on. And these are the two different factions of so-called black people. So this has always been going on, you know, the people being split in two. Um, you know, one wanted to help Europeans and one didn't, did, didn't want to help Europeans. All right. So now we're going to move on to another part. All right, check this out. Under the aggressive leadership of Troop, his increasingly well-organized party made steady he headway against the wavering Clarkides. I'm reading just, just different governors in Georgia now. He moved quickly to consolidate his hard-won power by pushing a very popular policy, Indian removal. Listen very, very closely. Troop aggressively concentrated on the Creeks, who still held most of West Central Georgia, as I just showed you in the map. It says right here, it says that troop aggressively concentrated on the Creeks who still owned most of western central Georgia. Just like in the map I just showed you. You see the, you see the whole western part of Georgia? Aborigines are still ruling this. So you had a governor that came in and said, okay, I'm going to use a political campaign of the Indian removal. And this is what's going to get me in power. I mean, this, is, this is some of the political information and political energy he was using to get himself elected by saying he's going to get these aborigines out of here and take the land for the quote unquote white people so let's continue in recent years these Indians had expanded their traditional agriculture while de-emphasizing their old hunting ways the Creeks refused to cede more of their land to Georgia President Monroe was sympathetic to Georgia but unwilling to use force to remove the Indians. Governor Troop, with the full support of the legislature and the people, continued to pressure the federal government, which finally commissioned two Georgians to negotiate the Creeks with the Creeks. After several rebuffs and much blatant manipulation, they finally reached an agreement with Chief William McIntosh, the Scott Creek first cousin of Troop, and some other leaders of the Lower Creeks who had no clear mandate for their people from their people first of all I want to say this so you see also too that a lot of the negotiations and a lot of the um, you know deals were being done by a lot of these mixed aborigines so they weren't really doing business and doing you know deals with full-blooded aborigines they doing a lot of it with mixed aborigines because they saying right here that that chief William McIntosh which was a half Scott half Creek was a cousin of Governor Troop. And they're saying that, you know, some of the other leaders of the Lower Creeks had no mandate from their people. So in other words, you got folks who are somewhat related to these Caucasians because their people have bleached into this Aborigine bloodline. And this is also how a lot of the land was given over as well. You know, this is how a lot of the land was given over as well. So you had the federal government and state governments trying to get aborigines to cede their land over to them and a lot of these aborigines didn't want to do it so what they did was is they would use people who were of mixed descent you know half aborigine and half european and get and do deals with them and get them to give the land over and that's basically what happened the treaty of indian springs of 1825 ceded all of the creeks georgia land and it was ratified by the federal government in the last days of the monroe administration Government troop pressed the pliant Macintosh for an in immediate survey to prepare the whole area for distribution by lottery. But Macintosh and several other Indian leaders who had signed the treaty were murdered by angry Creeks determined to hold their lands. Look at this shit. Let me repeat. It says the Treaty of Indian Springs of 1825 ceded all of the Creeks Georgia land. So that means in this Treaty of Indian Springs of 1825 gave away all of the creeks the creek aborigines land in georgia to the state government and it was ratified by the government or the federal government in the last days of the monroe administration and then it goes on to say that governor troop was going to hold a lottery to basically distribute and give away these people land 
but it said that this guy McIntosh, who was this half Scott, half Creek um, Indian who was related to Troop, they say right here that he was murdered by angry Creeks that was determined to hold their own land. So this is what you had. You had a lot of these mixed as Native American as people who were doing deals with the United States, seeing what they can carve out of it and get out of it for themselves. But they were speaking on behalf of all Aborigines. You know what I'm saying? All people who are autonomous or indigenous to the land. So then you have this guy say, OK, we're going to give away some of the land. But he's not even a full Aborigine himself. You know what I'm saying? He's really a mutt. But, you know, they give away the land. And then when these other original Angry Creeks figure out about this shit, they killed them. So you had a lot of that going on. A lot of these mulatto mixed, you know what I'm saying, Native Americans were actually doing these business deals on behalf of the entire Aborigine population. Selling out the entire Aborigine population probably just for themselves and a few people who were mixed like them. And, and, and this is what happened. You know what I'm saying? This is a lot of what happened, you know. So another thing I saw in the comment section, a lot of you all are asking me, what are the origins of these um, Asiatic Mongols? You know, you see, you hear about this Asiatic Mongol presence in the um, ancient Americas and where did this come from? And a lot of us are tying them in with these Native Americans. What I tell you is this. First of all, ancient America had more than one type of black person that was here. These Asiatic Mongols that we are reading and hearing about were a so-called black people. They just so happened to have Asian looking eyes and they had a different texture of hair. But they were black, you know, copper colored skin people, bronze colored, bronze colored skin people just like we are. You know what I'm saying? So these Asiatic Mongols that we're talking about are basically the original people of Asia who are so-called black. And a group of those people were also here in the Americas. So in the Americas, you had multiple types of black people. You know, you had your so-called traditional Negro that, excuse me, that we all know of. And then you had those Asiatic Mongols who were another group of black people, except they had another type of hair and certain other type of features. You know, so this is why it looks real confusing when you look at a lot of, you know, Aboriginal or ancient American pictures. You can't figure out, well, who are the people that are originally from here? That's who was originally from here. You know, the Aborigine so-called Negro, which is us, black, your traditional black person. And then you have these Asiatic Mongols who are also just black people, uh, except they just look a little different. And these were some of the two groups that were here. OK, now, as far as these European white Spanish looking people that are calling themselves Native Americans with black straight hair. To me, those are nothing but Caucasian people. You know, those are Caucasian people that more than likely came over here and they were completely European. But I think they may have mixed in their blood with some other people who were already mixed. OK, because when you look at a lot of these so-called Native Americans today, they look straight Caucasian. They don't even look mixed like they don't look like it was no Negro blood anywhere near them. So that leads me to believe that most of these so-called Native American groups today that are on these Indian reserves or on, on TV that they show you. These are basically Europeans who had already who mixed in with some people that were from America that were already mixed themselves. So like, for example, when they tell, talk about this guy who is half Scottish and half uh, Creek Indian. OK, first of all, he's already mixed. So now imagine a European coming here and mixing in with him. Now you're going to have somebody who looks a little more Caucasian. Because he's, once again, all he's doing is, is bleaching out more and more of his melanin. And this is how you're going to have today a Caucasian looking person with straight stringy black hair. But he's calling himself a, tr a Creek or a Choctaw or a so-called Native American. This is where that look came from. You know, so the ancient Americans had a majority, um, you know, it's Negro population is, is, is what you need to realize. All right. So, you know, at this time, this guy, the governor of Georgia is um, this guy Troop. All right. So just keep that in mind. And what I want you to look into is, is the Treaty of Indian Springs of 1825, which ceded all of the Creeks, Georgia land to, um, you know, basically the state municipality. And then shortly after that, it was ratified by the federal government. So this is, you know, leading you into what's known as the Trail of Tears, all right, as we're going to read into in a minute. But let's continue. 
So it says, emboldened by victory, Governor Troop re resumed his fight with the federal government over the creek lands. Fully supported by both parties in the legislature, he reasserted the validity of the Treaty of Indian Springs and renewed his plans for a quick survey. However, despite a roar of protest from Georgia, President Adams negotiated a new treaty with the Creeks that ceded all of their Georgia lands except a small, narrow slice along the Alabama border. This treaty of Washington of January 1826 was almost as cynical and corrupt as the original one, but Governor Troop was not satisfied. So not only did Governor Troop in the so-called state of Georgia come in and try to steal your land, then the federal government and the president came behind with a whole new treaty that was trying to steal even more of the land. All right. He denounced federal interference and began to survey Creek lands ahead of the deadline set by the new treaty. He also ordered a survey of the thin slice of Georgia land retained by the Creeks. Finally, he threatened to resist any federal military force and even altered some state militia districts. The federal government had no real sympathy for Indians, so by the end of 1827, further negotiations had extinguished all Creek lands claimed in Georgia. The Creeks were finished. The Cherokees were next. So this is what they were doing. They were moving around and expanding what they call United States territory or state territory. And any Aborigines that had control of the land. This is who they had a new conflict with. So what I just got done reading to you is basically the conflict of, you know, the Europeans who were under the faction of Georgia, the state government of Georgia, the corporation of Georgia, those European settlers under that faction having problems with the Creek, the Creek Aborigines who were indigenous to the lands of what they call Georgia or what we call Georgia. And through this guy, um, Governor Troop, and through this guy, William McIntosh, this mixed Creek Scottish motherfucker and through the Treaty of Indian Springs of 1825 this started the process of the Creeks losing the western part of Georgia and then shortly after that you had President John Quincy Adams come in and he set up the Treaty of Washington of January 1826 and this eventually took more of the land but it says right here it says the federal government had no real sympathy for Aborigines so by the end of 1827 Further negotiations had extinguished all Creek land claims in Georgia. The Creeks were finished. The Cherokees were next. So that means that from about, uh, like I said, from about 1775 to about 1827, here in Georgia, you had the Europeans trying to steal land from the Creeks, the Creek Aborigines, which is basically another group of so-called um, black people that were from indigenous America. And then they eventually got the land with the help of, once again, mixed, you know, mixed so-called Indians who were teaming up with the United States. All right. And then it says after they stole the land from them, now they're looking to steal the land from the, the Cherokee Aborigines. So this is what they were doing. They were just going around to different places in Georgia and just stealing the land from whatever Aborigines were there. So it says that the Creeks had majority of like central West Georgia. And it says right here, although more moderate than his predecessor, Forsyth still favored Indian removal. So Georgia exerted increasing pressure against the stubborn Cherokees in the northwestern part of the state. So that means the Cherokees were, were located in the northwestern part of the state. All right. The northwestern part of the state. This is where the Cherokees were, were, were located. Um, they even have a Cherokee county in Georgia. All right. They have a Cherokee county in North Georgia. You know, I remember when I would have a lot of AAU tournaments and AAU basketball games. You know, we would have some games in like North Georgia, in like Cherokee County, and 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 and, and shit like that. Um, that's how I remember physically going up there. But nevertheless, this is where these names come from. Um, a lot of you all may have heard of Forsyth, Georgia before. A lot of you all have heard of Forsyth, Georgia before, and a lot of you all may have also heard about certain riots. And different conflicts between the blacks and the whites in Forsyth, Georgia. Well, this is a continuation of this same problem. Because Forsyth, believe it or not, was a governor. Let me read about him real quick. Or he's a congressman, rather. It says, 
Georgia voters were not particularly impressed with the sub, sub, subtleties of state rights doctrine, but they did, did like the way Governor Troop and his followers got things done, even when harassed by the federal government. Troop's decision to prepare for a return to the United States Senate did not seriously disturb his party, which gathered a legislative caucus in December of 1826 and selected Congressman John Forsyth as its gubernatorial gubernatorial candidate. Excuse me. Governor Forsyth reluctantly cooperated with the legislator created by the Central Bank of Georgia, a virtual government bank and treasury. So in other words, this guy Forsyth, okay, was a governor. And it says right here, Forsyth still favored Indian removal. So Georgia exerted increasing pressure against the stubborn Cherokees in the northwestern part of the state. Most of these cities, states in Georgia, cities and states in Georgia are named after congressmen and generals and certain other political figures that actually played a key part in the Aborigines land being stolen. There is another city in Atlanta called Decatur, Georgia. There's another city called Decatur, Georgia. And Decatur, Georgia is named after a general in the United States wars against the Barbary states. Okay. The United States wars against the Barbary states. And, and this guy, General Decatur, was um, a United States, you know, I, I guess soldier or whatever, who was responsible for burning up some of the... Um, burning up some of the trans the water transportation of the moors along the coast of you know northwest north africa all right so even decatur georgia is named after a general in the united states war versus the barbary states which were just the moors from africa okay so think about that for a minute why is a city in, in atlanta named decatur why is that named after a general that was in a war against Moors in Africa. If none of this stuff was connected, just think about that, and I'm and I'm gonna leave you on that. You know, I'm gonna leave you on that. If the Moors in Africa were not connected to the Aborigines of America, why would they name a city in Atlanta after a man who fought in the United States Army against the Moors of North Africa? Why didn't they name it? Why didn't they name his stuff over there? Why did they name it right here in Atlanta? You know, so that's just a little bit of history. So when you look into these names, you know, that's what you're going to get. Um, for example, you know, Stone Mountain. That's another place. If you go to Stone Mountain, you will see that guy Robert E. Lee's name everywhere. They have a street named after him over there. Robert E. Lee is one of these same Confederate generals in the Civil, in the Civil War that I'm telling you about. You know, who was not no friend of ours. You know, even in Decatur, they have a Civil War um, cemetery that I've been to before. You know, they have a Civil War cemetery. So this information is very, very powerful. And um, a lot of it is in Georgia. You know what I'm saying? A lot of it is in Georgia. So I just wanted to go through a little bit of that. Little bit of that. You know, I was kind of stuttering and shit. But, you know, either way it go, you got the information, I hope. So. But yeah, man, it's the boy Black Bear Mirage. You know, it's just some history of Georgia. Um, you want to know the book I was reading? This is what I was reading out of. The History of Georgia. You know what I'm saying? This is the book. But, but yeah, man, it's the boy Black Bear, you know. A little history. You know what I'm saying? But um, y'all stay tuned. And as usual, 